Hi, I'm Emily, and with me is Pastor Zach. This week, your sermon covered Genesis 46. Why is Jacob referred to sometimes as Israel and sometimes as Jacob in this chapter? Well, of course, we know that Israel is the covenant name that Jacob has received uh, from God directly. And so the narration of these latter chapters of Jacob's life we find the narration switching back and forth at times between referring to him by his covenant name, Israel, and by the name that we've known him as this whole time of Jacob. And sometimes it's not always abundantly clear why there's a switch back and forth. But I think in in chapter 46, you'll notice that often when the kind of national implications are involved or when a a more significant aspect of not only Jacob's own future, but of his family's future is involved, that he's referred to by his covenant name. Um, And so, you know, as we, as we kind of look at how this plays out in, in the chapter, when God is, it says, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night. And then immediately after he said, Jacob, Jacob. So we've got these, these two names for Jacob immediately set uh, in, in relation to one another. And I think the reason for that is we need to understand that God is speaking to Israel, Israel, Jacob, but also Israel, the nation, that it is okay now to go down to Egypt. That This is where God is going to grow this family into a great nation. But he also then addresses Jacob personally, Jacob, Jacob. It's, it's not merely this covenantal communication. It also is a personal communication to the patriarch who is the head of this family. So at times, I think the name Israel is given to help remind us that Jacob's patriarchal status means that he's really the covenant head of this whole family, and therefore of the burgeoning nation. And at other times, his personal name is used to highlight that there still is the man behind the nation, the man who is having to make these difficult choices and pull up stakes and leave the home that he's known for all of his, his life, leave the land of his fathers and make this difficult and arduous journey to Egypt. Those two realities and tension, the national and personal elements, the covenantal and the relational aspects are all, I think, imbued in these two different names that uh, characterize uh, the description of Jacob in the latter part of, of the book of Genesis. In verse 26, it says that Jacob had 66 descendants, while in verse 27, it said that he had 70. Which number is correct and why do they seem to contradict each other? Each other? You know, they're both correct, and there, there isn't a contradiction here. There's an explanation there when the 70 numbers use that now we seem to be including also Joseph and his sons. And so really the 66 and then later the 70, the 66 seem to be the, the number of those who have been named in the genealogy. And then the additional number getting up to 70 includes Joseph and his sons, as well as probably Jacob himself. So do depending on who you who you count in the genealogy and who you count in the total 70, sometimes you'd include Jacob and Joseph and his sons, other time exclude them. That's how you end up getting to that number. But also we need to point out that likely it is a, a much more significant group of people that's headed down to Egypt than just the 66 who go and the 70 in total of, of Jacob's family that end up being, uh, being there in Egypt. The text specifies that this is 70 of Jacob's family. But if we recall, going all the way back to many chapters ago, uh, even in the time of Abraham, Abraham had a huge household uh, that he was leading, 300 men at his disposal that he was able to go and uh, and call to his aid to go chase down the, the kings uh, that had taken Lot, his, his nephew, and the, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that retinue of servants and men, we know that that Abraham continued to increase. He then passes that on to Isaac. Presumably, Isaac passes that on to his son, Jacob, who is the recipient of both the birthright and the blessing. And so uh, there's there's almost certainly more people in Jacob's retinue, perhaps not as many as in the heyday of, of Abraham's life, but certainly more than just his relatives. The number that we're given there are just uh, the actual descendants of Jacob, not the total persons of his household. What is the significance of God's promise to go down with Jacob to Egypt? I think it it reminds us, one, that God is a God of covenant faithfulness, that that God is not going to abandon uh, Jacob or Jacob's descendants while they are in Egypt, that he is going to be with them wherever they go. 
It's a continuation of God's promise, just like he had promised previously to be with Jacob when Jacob was preparing to leave the land of Canaan. Now God is, is doing the same thing. It's also an important lesson to Jacob that the God with whom he is dealing is not a God in any way confined by geographical boundaries. Yes, the promised land is really significant in the book of Genesis. It's an integral part and really at the heartbeat of the Abrahamic covenant of this signifier that God is going to be faithful to the other aspects, the more spiritually embodied aspects of the covenant, that the land is the stake where Abraham's family is going to be able to to put their, their tents in the ground and eventually build for themselves a nation in this place, that God's going to give it to them. But God isn't restricted to the boundaries of the promised land. He's not like the gods that Jacob's family is going to encounter in Egypt, who are gods of the Nile or over over certain regions of the Delta or all these different things. He's not like the Canaanite gods who are confined to particular localities. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is unlike all of the other gods known in the ancient Near East. This is a God who is present everywhere. He can be present with Isaac back, you know, an earlier generation. He can be present with Isaac where Isaac dwells and also be going with Jacob as Jacob goes to find a wife. This is an omnipresent God. So there's once again this both this covenantal comfort we must we might say that Jacob is being comforted by God that he's not going down alone to Egypt. That the God of the covenant is going with him. The God of the promises is going with him. And also a reminder to Jacob the God who is on his side, the God of his fathers, is a God unlike the gods of all the people around him. Why does Moses reference Laban in verse 18? Is it just a blast from the past? It's interesting there. We're reminded as we're given the sons of Leah and then of Rachel and then of their female servants, Bilhah and Zilpah, when the maidservants are mentioned, there's this note that Moses gives us reminding us that these are the maidservants that Laban's uh, Laban, the father of Leah and Rachel, had given to his daughters. And at first glance, it's a little bit odd, seemingly, to include a reference to Laban there. It's not as though the reader is likely to have already forgotten where these women came from. And presumably, if you remember where Leah and Rachel are from, you're also going to remember where their maidservants are from. So it, it, first, it seems a little bit odd. But I think the inclusion of Laban's name there is intentionally crafted by Moses to help us as we're reading this genealogy, this list of names, really think about what the significance of this genealogy is. When Jacob was serving Laban for all of those years, he was a loner in a a land that his family had left long ago, serving with long lost relatives, we might think of it. And at that point, he was serving for a wife. He had no other wives. He had no children. He was a single individual who was bearing the birthright and the blessing of Isaac, who was the miraculous child of promise to Abraham and Sarah in their old age, and had now passed on those promises to Jacob. But the looming question similarly that had been at issue with Abraham and Sarah and their barrenness, and then with Isaac and Rebekah and their barrenness, now with Jacob. Jacob, what is what is his prospects for a wife and a family? And and as he serves and then gets a wife and then another wife and then these two maidservants, this individual man, this single individual, suddenly grows into a man who has 12 sons and then they have children and and their families are growing. And by the time that Jacob is ready to go to Egypt to leave the land of promise for the second time, he's no longer leaving as a single individual like the first time he left. Now he's going as this large family that is on the brink of becoming a great nation, the nation that God had promised. So I think the inclusion of Laban's name recalls to mind the last time that Jacob left and how different the circumstances are for Jacob now and how much we can see that God's been true to his word to, to grow this this little group into a, a large and growing family. In your sermon, you mentioned some connections and parallels between this passage and previous episodes in Genesis. Are there any other connections? You know, I think it's interesting, both times that, that Jacob leaves Canaan, he's leaving to escape an existential threat. The first time he's fleeing for his life because Esau, he thinks, is on his heels ready to kill him. The next time he leaves, he's escaping a famine. Um, both times, Jacob is, is not only leaving behind a danger that is present for him in the land of Canaan, but he's also going to establish or reestablish some kind of intimate 
family connection. So he's he's leaving Canaan the first time, not only to escape Esau, but to find a wife. The second time he leaves, he's not only leaving to escape a famine, he's going to be reunited with his long lost son. So there's a number of, of interesting similarities there. When Jacob leaves the first time, he encounters God at night in visions and God tells him not to be afraid to leave Canaan to go get a wife because God would be with him. The same thing happens as he's preparing to leave, no longer at Bethel this time, but at Beersheba. God appears to him and says, don't be afraid to go. I will be with you. But it also creates then some interesting contrasts between the life of Jacob and the life of his father, Isaac. Isaac was forbidden from leaving Canaan to go and find a wife. Abraham wouldn't let him go. It was, in fact, Abraham made his servant swear not to allow Isaac to leave the land of Canaan to go get a wife. And in contrast, Jacob is permitted and even encouraged to leave the land of Canaan to go get a wife. Similarly, Isaac was forbidden from leaving the land of Canaan to escape a famine. Jacob is encouraged by God to leave the land of of Canaan to escape a famine. So what we see in that are these mirrored correspondences, both within Jacob's own life and and earlier periods of his own history, and then even with some interesting parallels with his own father's life, that we're seeing this progression that is the systematic unfolding of God's plan, that what had been off-limits to Isaac because it wasn't right at the right time for this family's history is now the appropriate next step for Jacob. And even what had happened in Jacob's own life was in some ways a preparation for a, a greater unveiling of those same concepts later in his life of escaping danger and family reunion. And, and so I think what, what we see in that is the unity in this narrative that's featured so many different situations and characters but there's been an underlying thread of, of the unity of God's purpose and plan that we might miss if we don't step back and consider this story as a, as a unified narrative rather than a series of isolated stories. If you have any questions from the sermon or the sermon passage that you would like to have answered on the podcast, please email them by 8 a.m. on Tuesday morning to questions at westcanon.org. We'll see you next week.